garbage there. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Art House. And thank you for joining us for our first Community Culture Night of 2023. Happy New Year. We are able to bring these free lectures to you thanks to the PNC Charitable Trust, Robert H. Rickert Foundation Equities, the Kyle Arts and Culture, many of our other funders, and you, of course, for supporting the arts through your tax dollars. Be sure to come to our ABC Chili Cook-Off. It's our seventh year. It's a very fun benefit event. And the next Community Culture Night will be in April. Our 19th yearly Urban Bright exhibition will open on May 5th. It is with great pleasure that I can introduce Brent Key Young to you tonight. He is an accomplished artist whose work is held in dozens of museums around the world. To name a few, the Hokkaido Museum of Art in Sapporo, Japan, the glass, first contemporary glass museum in Madrid, Spain, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, and the Cleveland Museum of Art. He has lectured, presented at conferences, and has conducted workshops in glass blowing, casting, and furnace construction throughout the US and abroad. Before retiring, Brent led the CIA, the Cleveland Institute of Art Glass Department, and in 1990, also built and led the glass department in Aichi University of Education in uh, Korea, Korea City, Japan. <laughs> Included in the numerous honors that he has received are the Victor Schreckengoss Teacher Award, the Kaiho Arts and Culture Creative Workforce Fellowship, and the Imagine Museum's Artist of the Future for Uniting Science and Art. His work is also included in 50 Years of Studio Glass, a selection of the 50 top glass artists working worldwide. Brent earned his MFA from the State University of New York College of Ceramics at Alfred University and his BA from San Jose State. Yeah. Please welcome Brent Key Young. done some research. Yeah. Uh, she knows more, me about, more about me than I do myself. <laughs> Ladies, if you don't want to sit on a cold toilet seat, make sure you leave that door open. Wow. Somebody shut it. it <laughs> uh, what I have for you today is a short video of glass blowing. Uh, well, we're going to show that and then that kind of sets the stage for what I'm what I was doing earlier, because I did quite a lot of blowing, especially when I, when I first came to Cleveland. And then I have a very short video of my later work, and it should answer most of the questions that you have. And then I have uh, four sets of images of like inspiration, and then I'll take you through uh, what I'm thinking about and how I produce one of the pieces that you see like over in the museum. So, uh, let's show the video of the, the DVD first. Okay. And we'll kind of go chronologically from there. And I, I'm open to any kind of question, and I'll try to answer stuff. And if you guys want to move forward, uh, nobody's going to bite anybody, so this is good. You ready? Sure. <laughs> seen my work understand that nature plays an important role in the inspiration of what I do. The fossil series exemplifies that in that it is both natural and contemporary at the same time. It's not only natural but it can it came from the idea of flaying fish and when you flay fish right my brother-in-law tells me that you can see the whole skeleton 
And from that, I had the idea that I could use that as an image of the pieces. So I, I got a torch and I learned how to flame work and I decided I could invent a way to put that fossil-like image in the interior of the piece. And what we're going to look at in this video is the process of making one of those fossil series pieces. Well, people are very interested in how these pieces are made. And perhaps it'd be interesting to, to follow along with uh, the preliminary steps of getting the pieces made. The imagery is made first. But before we make the imagery, we have to pull cane from the same glass. That's these glass rods. It's the same glass that we use for the pieces so that in the end, everything marries and fits together nicely. So here we are pulling some cane. The, the pieces, the imagery of the pieces are flame worked, and we use um, the same glass rods from the same kind of glass. Here we are making uh, what ends up being a shell like, shell like image. And it's made one segment at a time, and this element is used a lot in my pieces. This kind of spiral shape. The shell form is wound up from that segmented image. Remember that image here, okay? Mm -hmm. It'll appear later. This is cool. That's a shell form. And here we are making the backbone for what is going to end up being a fish skeleton. So here's the backbone shape. And then each of the spines of the fish is added to the backbone, one spine at a time. It's a pretty long and kind of tedious process. And at any point, the piece can break. So you have to be very careful about it. And the glass that is being added contact if it's fluid, the rest of the piece has to stay at a temperature that is above where it's going to break, but not so cold that it will crack. So here we are forming uh, what will be the tail of the piece. And you have to understand that in the resultant image in the form, the glass form, this is all going to be negative. But we're actually working with a positive image here in clear glass. Here we are making a head. I think this is going to be the head of the piece. It's formed with little bits of hot glass and it's shaped. The black you see on the form is carbon, and it's a way of annealing the glass temporarily so that uh, it can all stay together. And then it's placed on a metal plate. And Remember that guy right there? And then preheated before the blowing process actually begins. So all of that work was preliminary to the hot, hot shop work. This is normal glass blowing procedure here. It's gathering enough glass up on the pipe to have enough so that we can make the shape that we're going to make. So through a series of successive gathers, Actually, we can get enough glass to <laughs> the base of the floor. Each gather is blocked, inflated, and then blown out and then gathered again. 
This process is called blocking. This next gather will be the gather that we add the color to. And there are different methods for adding color to the piece. One of them is to sift the color on in a series of powders that end up being the sub base into which the imagery is placed. Once the color is laid on, then we need to shape it in a way that um, we'll be able to take the images. Here's the uh, images being reheated in the background and the piece being shaped in the front without the imagery on it. And the piece is placed into a, uh, made into a cylinder so that there is a section, uh, a linear section where the imagery imagery can sit. And the imagery is heated to the point where it's almost molten and the carbon starts to burn off and then the imagery is picked up and pushed into the surface of the glass. That happens through a series of reheats and what we call marvering, which is rolling on this steel plate to push the imagery in to the surface of the piece. More imagery is added at certain times. And then all of this is reheated and marvered, which is this rolling through successive times to successive reheats and marvers to make the whole surface smooth again. There's not too much inflating on these fossil pieces because I'm very interested in keeping the dimension of the image in the form. If we were to blow it out too much, then the imagery starts to flatten out. And I'm really interested in uh, how dimensional I can make that interior of the form. So the clear glass images are an intermediate step to create a negative relief impression, which is what I'm interested in, in getting. Once the images are marvered in and the piece is blown out, more gathers are gathered over the outside of the piece to create uh, enough volume again to create the shape. The piece is not blown out much more. It's just shaped. And then, um, and in this case, we have, a, we have a foot on the bottom. gather to get enough glass on the vault um, to create even more dimension and depth in the form and also create um, what ends up being a foot on the bottom of the form. A lot of the glass blowing methods are very traditional. What makes these pieces unique is the method of creating the images, which end up being uh, in negative relief on the interior of the form. So all these shaping techniques uh, are much like what you would see with many of the people that are working in contemporary glass working at the bench. Here the piece is being transferred uh, from 
one end to the other so we can finish both ends of the piece. It's going to be taken off of the pipe at this point. And then through a series of reheating and shaping so we can conclude the forming process of, of the piece. You can see the negative image in here. And the piece is taken off and annealed. The annealing takes about four days to finish the piece and then we're cold worked with grinding and polishing to finish the, the bottoms and if there are facets in the side. I like the idea that I can take something from outside the the glass, the normal glass realm, and bring something to it, rather than working within the constructs of the medium. It's a nice thing, and I encourage my students to do that, to be able to work. I often say it's it's not what you do with the medium, what's important is what you can bring to it. So being a part of that environment that surrounds you and being sensitive to it helps me be inspired for the kinds of things that I do. has gone and I have some of them have come back. Actually those three have come back. They're they're all here in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So they, they went away and came back. Mm -hmm. cool. So this is later later work. This is this is only three minutes and then we'll kind of get on with it. Want me to go ahead? Sure, why not? Okay. This is one part of a process that's much larger. Right now it's tedium. I'm just trying to create this matrix, this line of glass that meanders organically into this area right here and fill it so that it's even throughout. So the whole piece will have to get this kind of treatment. And then we're gonna build out to the next cylinder and then put it inside another cube. I'm originally from California. Born in Los Angeles, raised in the Central Valley, Modesto. Went on to San Jose State University in engineering. I had a friend at San Jose that introduced me to the ceramics department there. I had gone into engineering to make stuff. The way you built was so formulaized that the ceramics seemed to resonate with me more than engineering. And I had this kind of catharsis and decided that I would change majors because this glass that we're using is such a low coefficient of expansion, we can build in this manner and it takes a lot of shock. So we can put the torch right on it like this and it's cold and it can go from cold to, you know, a couple of thousand degrees in the matter of seconds. It's very durable and very rugged. And we're working with elements that are thin enough to take that kind of shock as well. I think that my studies in school in engineering are great background for understanding how to work with materials. 
you know, understanding the physics of this particular glass as opposed to earlier works that were done in soda lime glass helps me. In high school, I had a geometry teacher that was really great. His name was Jay Patti. He made geometry so much fun. There were so many theorems and all this stuff you kind of had to memorize. But he taught geometry more like a foreign language. He'd say a theorem and then he'd have the students say it out loud and repeat it. He was kind of full of this kind of crazy idea. And I think we learned geometry through osmosis rather than having it kind of pounded into us. But I do go back to geometry a lot in terms of the way I construct things and, and look at things. Next door to the studio here, there was a Wonder Bread factory. This was a number of years ago, and they tore that down when they raised that building. At the end, they were shaking all the concrete out of this pile of rebar, and they had a rat's nest of a reinforcing rod the size of a house that was left over from the deconstruction. I thought it would be interesting and fun to go in there and weld that rebar together and then take a transit, line that thing up, and cut it into a geometric shape. I tried building a piece out of glass with that, and I constructed it in a way that was a matrix of interconnected glass elements. I showed that in the faculty show, and they were pretty excited to see the glass in this way, and there was a lot of curiosity as to how I was able to make the thing. So that was encouraging, and I started building in that manner. I like to say that life is long, and there's a lot of work left in all of us, so... I don't think we're going to retire from making work. I think that's something that we're going to be doing until forever, maybe, you know, who knows. Uh, so I'll take you through the process. I'll talk about some things. Uh, and let's see if we can make this thing work too. Uh, so I had lost all my images and because of this, I had called the Apple people and they helped me uh, recover everything that I had, had lost. Some of these images are from, from Japan, some of them are early and they're kind of a mishmash, but they are, they're kind of where I've been and kind of up to where I am now. I'll show you some of my castings. You asked about that. And um, let's see what happens here. So my early work in clay at San Jose, this is undergrad work, um, was after, uh, like, I started clay and glass about the same time. And my actual work in clay was stronger than my glass work, but I showed glass in my portfolio when I was applying to grad school. You had mentioned Alfred. I applied clay there to, to go in, in, in clay. Uh, I was very influenced by the land at that point. You can see this in, in my clay work. And this is an example of the kind of work I was doing when I finished uh, at San Jose. It's not when I applied, but when I finished up my last semester where I was doing this body of work as one of my uh, graduate, undergraduate thesis. Uh, it has to do with the land. I was doing a lot of breeding and drainage plans and uh, sewage plans while I was engineering. So it's kind of a reflection of those kinds of things and I, kind of, I brought that into my artwork. So uh, this is a slot canyon in the Southwest. We do travel a lot. I love the American Southwest. We do, do go there. Uh, this is one of those places where if you go in there, you gotta be careful and the light it's just wonderful in there, and it's all carved by uh, sand and water. And uh, the fossil series, which you see, there's, I brought one in for you guys to take a look at after mm -hmm. the thing is over, or you know, you can pull over here now if you want. But the whole fishing thing, and you've seen this. Here's some of those things, and I have some of those in a box here so you can see those. So the fossil series pieces, I the lamp working, the flame working, is kind of specific to these pieces. Uh, it was started in 1978, I think, is about when I was starting the first fossil series pieces. So here's a few of those pieces. In 
to be able to put a negative relief image on the interior of a glass vessel looks pretty cool. Uh, a lot of the glass artists and people that work in glass couldn't figure out how I was making it. They thought I, they thought I was carving it and then uh, casing it and kind of backfilling the glass in. It was quite, quite the opposite. So this image appears in nature, right? So it, it's not, you know, seeing it again, and it kind of reinforces things. This is this is a, an octopus leg. If you hold the octopus by his head when you're going to cook it, and you drop his legs in, they curl up like this. And uh, if you go to Astoria, you can have octopus there. They have it here in town. <laughs> so it's not a far stretch when you're looking at something like this to try to recreate that in clay. So this is plastic clay, and uh, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking earlier about, about casting. Here's some castings and using using uh, kind of a lost clay technique that I more or less put together. So this is like a, a sushi boat. Instead of sushi, you've got these ammonite shapes in there. So uh, yeah, monolithically cast in an open face mold. Uh, the, the, it's a one-off deal. There's no wax in here. And the clay is just as essentially dug out of the mold, and then it's put into a kiln and then fired, and uh, the glass is introduced to it. And this is pretty common glass. You can see it around in the buildings around town. It's, uh, it comes from Blanco, West Virginia, and it comes in these dolls that are about an inch thick, and they're about a foot by eight inches, different colors. And we were playing around with those. Those the texture has been oh here's another this is from Japan uh, an idea that when you truncate something you kind of redefine it so you can see it in a different way jumping around here is a uh, open slice of bamboo that's been truncated so you can see the interior structure here is the interior of a, a glass blown glass vessel. Using that same idea of truncation or carving. Here's another one. More of an abstract shape. And all that is buried inside the glass so it's subsurface. I talked about geometry in that earlier, uh, earlier video about uh, geometry in school. This is a water ewer at uh, Duranji. That famous uh, famous garden in in, uh, in Japan. So I mean, look at the proportions of that, and then look at the proportions of this casting, and then also look at that shape. You know, there's a cube there, so that's a geometric shape too. That gets that kind of geometry gets used a lot in, in Japan, and that has carried from clay on into the glass. <laughs> Here's a, a roof of a temple. Marty and I were there in Japan for about a year and a half, so it was time to, to travel and see a lot of a lot of really interesting uh, artwork and a lot of interesting crafts there. So these castings are they're not huge, but they're fairly big. They're somewhere on the order of like about like this, this big. And what people are casting now, some of the pieces are like hundreds of pounds. They're crazy. Is the rippling part of the casting? Is, is that the all of the casting, or is that? Well, good question. Can I go back to this then and answer that question? So everything you see there is in the clay. So all the texture, the ammonite, the, uh, the negative space, all that whole, so I end up with a clay object that looks just like this first. The mold is poured around it, essentially. And then uh, it's more complicated than that, but essentially that's it. And then the clay is dug out. 
How long is the annealing process? Long. Yeah, how, how long? 400 hours. Oh my gosh. Yeah, over 400 hours, three weeks. Wow. Because they're still thick, right? So, uh, it's, you know, understanding the physics of the material, which is so interesting, uh, and experimenting and, and losing pieces too, you know? You crack the piece, oh my God, you know, that wasn't long enough. Or maybe it was too low of a temperature for the anneal. Maybe it was, you know, there was some technical aspect of what I had done that I had to, to reconfigure. How do you make the choice of using clay rather than like beeswax or, you know, the floss wax for me? So my undergraduate work was in what? Pardon? Clay. Oh, clay. Right? So, I mean, I'm more familiar with clay. Uh, and even, like when I came to the Institute, Jerome Adlin was, his beginning class, they were working with clay. And then they would make molds, and then they would make a wax, and then would make a, a mold of the wax. And you lost cast wax. Uh, box, cat, box. Right. Lost oh. wax casting <laughs> for bronze, right? So, you know, wax can be an, an intermediate step. I've tried working with glad, uh, wax to do some of the detailing for some of these things. It doesn't respond to your hand like clay does. Clay is just this wonderful medium for working. I, you know, one of the things, glass, you're always working with some kind of tool. Clay, you're working directly with your hands. It's, it's really, Okay, uh, those cubes. Okay, here's, I couldn't, I didn't get the building next door. It was on Chester Avenue, about 55th, and was the old Wonder Bread factory. When they took that thing down, it looked like this next door. So that, and it reminded me of other things. This rebar. This is an aerial view of a subdivision. I designed a lot of subdivisions. When I left the office there, I worked for Mid Valley Engineering from when I left high school all the way in to when I changed majors. I changed majors out of engineering into ceramics. I was still working for Mid Valley Engineering. And then I went to graduate school and I continued to work for Mid Valley Engineering. I would fly back to California and work for Christmas and then I'd go back. So I went back and forth. So that's what got me through college. But when I left that office, I had over 30 projects that I was working on all at once. And they were all late. Every one of them. Here's brain coral from you know the ocean. This is nature again, right? And you can see it, you can see stuff like this and it kind of it repeats itself. Here's a Kind of a linear thing going on in one of my pieces. So I'm, I'm not copying it, but I'm using it as a reference for, for, uh, or, or an inspiration for, for what I do. Mm. Geometry too. I mean, it's such a beautiful shape. And a root ball. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find a really good image oh. of a root ball. But there you have, you know, the form of the pot. And then you have the matrix of the roots. You know, Cleveland, right? <laughs> this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a they have a uh, an aquarium thing that's like the size of the ocean. You know, it's as big as this building, and they have you know like millions of these fish. But the glints of light in there are just wonderful to see. And and it, it, the work that you're looking at now, this the current work, you're not really looking at the glass, you're looking at the light. Because it's the light that you see, and it's the glints of light that define the form. And a lot of times when people ask me to describe my work, I say, imagine a tumbleweed. And mm -hmm. then imagine a tumbleweed made in glass. 
and then imagine a tumbleweed mating glass and cut into a cube. So here's one of the slot canyons, and uh, you know, some in another lifetime, maybe I can go out there and do an installation or something. Yeah. Geometry. This is uh, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, right? I've never been there. It's on a farm by the list to go see. This is a catenary arch. Mm. In my ceramic experience, we used to use a catenary to define a catenary arch for a kiln. It's called a, we call it catenary kiln. This appears in my work a lot, especially the early. And the geometric series, the geomet geometric pieces, I kind of, there were figments of my imagination, and I invented these forms so that I could learn how to build. So you figure out a form that you want to make, draw it out, and then you try to learn how to make it, as opposed to like the narrative, narrative pieces. So this catenary is a naturally occurring in nature. Here's another catenary. So this chain naturally will form a catenary arch. It cannot be, find, be defined by a, uh, an equation. So it's, it's not like an ellipse or, or a parabola. So, but it's very easy. Uh, you can have any width and any depth. So you can have a, a shape that is, you can help a short piece and it can have a very nice, nice bend in it or a very long one like this, and you can use it uh, to create a shape. You can deform it a little bit, right? So if you want it to have a little pointed, you pull on it a little bit, and it'll have a nice symmetrical shape like that. So here it's uh, you know a draw it out in, in sketch form, and then blow it up into a full scale model, cut it up into a template, and then draw it out. Build. So this is rotated into, it's a catenary this way, right? And this is an ellipse. So it's rotated to an elliptical form. So figuring all of this out was pretty crazy, but I built it all out of glass. And I used that form to work over. Here's one in the interior and one in the exterior. Mm. So this piece. It's probably somewhere on the order of oh, maybe 35 inches from top to bottom at this point. So it's an interior and an exterior idea. It's elliptical, so it's flat. It's not round. Uh, and it has this kind of curious texture to it, more or less. And then it being inspired by those things that you saw earlier. So here it is, you know, uh, the very early, the first four pieces I made in this series had metal bases on them. And I immediately went away from making a wooden base with a metal armature to hold this piece of glass. I decided that it would be just better to build the whole thing out of glass and have, have the whole thing unified. So it's working from the inside to the next letter, building a framework for this outside piece that's going to be the, essentially the foot or the holder. And here it is finished. How do you move that inside of the foot? <laughs> you know, they're, 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 they can be handled, and they, mm -hmm. they move fairly easily. I have a crate for each piece. That's one of the most often, uh, often asked questions. It's like, how are they handled? Have you washed the piece? Carefully. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have repaired them. So you drop one of Leno's pieces and you break it, uh, it's gone, right? Or you change it, it becomes something else. But because they're constructed, you know, like let's say I don't like this corner, take it out, rebuild it, put it back, or rebuild it in place. Mm. 
So is it a sign to the structure base structure that's holding that up? Is that well how much does that weigh? Yeah. Oh. Versus the the, the base portion. Oh, the whole piece probably doesn't weigh more than four pounds. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's it's like this tall. Yeah. Looks like it weighs a lot more than that. Yeah. Well there's mostly space, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's and again what you're looking at is you're looking at the way the light bounces off it. You're not looking at the glass. This is this is the piece at the museum. So it's standing on two trunk ends. Trunk ends. So here's another uh, mathematical idea. If you remember from school, this thing called volumes of solid revolution. This is your vertical axis, axis, and then. What I do is I rotate a frame. You can kind of see it here. See it right on the inside of this? Mm -hmm. And then you rotate this frame around this. I build these little handles so that you can hold on to it and turn it around. So while I'm wandering around, meandering with this shape, I know from where this wand is where that shape should be in space. Then when I move over to here, then I move this thing around. So I keep moving it around, and I keep moving it around as I'm building this piece up and over the top. And then I come back in and adjust it because it's never right. You know what I mean? I've got to keep working with it. But uh, it's how I create some of the some of the forms that are uh, symmetrical around a vertical axis. You can see the axis here, some support structures that hold the, the frame. Here's part of the frame. Here's a little maquette. So, you know, like rivers and uh, where rivers come together, here's the geometric shape, that geometric shape that I had earlier in, in some of the clay pieces. That's part of it. It carries through. Here is some bends to create that same meander. You see this kind of section here in the drawing behind here. This maquette's only about this big, but the drawing behind it is like this. Do you use drawing a lot to stage it? Yeah, yeah. So it's your first step? The first step is a thumbnail. Thumbnail sketches, right? And then, then they're exploded and then I do full-scale drawings, and then uh, I use the full-scale drawings and I cut them up into templates to draw on, on this graphite so that I can bend these rods to model after what I'm trying to do. So have you ever been approached to or commissioned to do something that's not a gym, but something more like, say, the skyline of Cleveland or something? I haven't. <laughs> I, you know, I, people have asked me. I don't. I rarely do a commission. You know, uh, it, it's been it's been fine. You know, I I have done a, a couple, but I don't make that a major part of what I do because I'm too busy doing something else. You know, it's like you now if somebody came to me and said. Uh, I want to do an aerial view of the Cuyahoga River. I could do an abstract of that. You know, I, I could do some research and find something like something and kind of build it into something. Uh, but I'd like to have a lot of license on it. I, I don't think I'd want to give it up to the aesthetics. Of it, you know. mm. So I call these cubisms. I've done a number of these pieces there. Kind of based on a cube, a lot of them have a sphere inside. Uh, the rationale, you don't want to know the rationale. <laughs> yeah, you do. The, the cubist painters, right, one of the things they did was they, they kind of took the color out of it and they used, uh, they tried to reduce everything down to geometric forms. So color was subdued. It wasn't like there was no color. These are colorless. 
so I, I kind of use that as an analogy for uh, what I'm doing with this. So if they take the color away, then you can better look at the geometry of the form or reduce forms down into geometric shapes you can look at it without being influenced by seeing a lot of this color. So one of the things I say when I'm talking to students and other people that want to put the glass, glass is so beautiful and so many people rely on color, which is also so beautiful, that glass is its own worst enemy because it gets in your way. So I decided early on when I started the series that I would just not do color at all so that I could concentrate on form. Now I'm toying around with the idea of color and I'm, I don't know what's going to happen yet, but I got some thoughts. And it won't be decorative, I can guarantee you that. And I'm not going to do Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm kind of interested in, in the precarious thing. I mean, the pieces are precarious already, but I'm kind of interested in the precariousness of what, what, what glass is. And I think it has something, it says something about the material if it's uh, presented in a way that is even more fragile. Where do these pieces go? Uh, the pieces go to collectors. And uh, there, there are a number of pieces in a couple of galleries that are around the country. And a lot of museums have, have them. So yeah, there's there. They're not all sitting in my studio. How do the collectors find out about Through the galleries. Do you have a specific gallery in Brooklyn? I have a specific gallery called Habitat in Michigan that has been very good for me. Uh, there was another gallery in Santa Fe, Jane Sauer Gallery, that I worked with her for a very long time, especially early on. And she finally retired. Uh, those are the two most active galleries that I've so, do you, do you retain ownership of these uh, sculptures if they're sent to a gallery? Uh, yes. And so, basically, you're leasing them? No. No, I retain ownership, but it's on consignment with the gallery. Okay. So, I consign the work to the gallery if they sell it. Uh, okay, so, yeah. it is, it's, so it's up for sale? Yes. Okay. Yes. What's yeah. the name of the gallery? H A B A T A T. Hmm. Where is that? Royal Oak. What size is? Oh. What size was that? Oh, these the cubes are around uh, 28, 30 inches. They're about like this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this piece is about 40. This is called. This is called Caddy Wampus for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it's almost can't exist. You know, it's like it's so precarious looking. It's crazy, but it it, it does. I mean, it, it, it's, it's existential. So. <laughs> you can see a little element in here, right here. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things, but they're connected all over. I mean, it's, there's a lot of points where it's connected. In here and it's a lot of points where it's connected to here. But when you look at it, it looks like it, it just can't stand there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's maybe a dumb question. When you're doing that, okay? Yeah. When you do the top, are you standing on a ladder? How do you do the top? The top? Yeah. Oh, these, this, this particular piece I've made, I made three cubes, right? <coughs> Oh. They're separate, and I figure out a way to lay them down and connect them, and get them connected first, and then stem them up. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a question from the Yeah, How do I what? How do you get them to like stay together? Oh, okay. Let's see. How can I use? So let's say you had. So chewing gum, right? You can pull it out into a string. And then 
she had another thing of chewing gum and you pulled it out into this thing. Do you think you could stick the two ends of those chewing gums together? Okay, so the glass when it's hot is really sticky. So the rods are like a, a finger of solid material, like chewing gum that's hard, and then you kind of stick the end of the chewing gum together. Stick it together on the side. So the glass itself is really, really sticky. And then once it's stuck together, then it stays together if you do it right. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay. Come to my studio. <laughs> Okay, so there's kind of a geometric side of my work, which mm -hmm. looked at a couple of those pieces. There's kind of a narrative side. Uh, some of the narratives, here's, here, I'll take you through a, uh, a thing. I wanted to do a thing about uh, research, travel, looking for stuff. This, this piece is called Quest. So this is, you know, this is pretty obvious. This is a canoe, some thumbnail sketches. Somebody asked about that. Mm -hmm. and here is a kind of a scale drawing that's been sectioned off so I can figure out how to make it. Here are a bunch of elements that I figured out I'm going to build with, much like building a boat. If you want to see a nice boat, Mark Petrovic, another glass worker who is over on Perkins, is building a stunner right now. He's rebuilding an old Craft and it is go online or see him on one of those social things. It's really cool. It's made out of glass? No. He's real rebuilding an old Chris Craft, but the way it's going together is fascinating, you know, because mm -hmm. he's taken it apart, put it back together. Oh, it's not quite right. Takes it apart, puts it back together again. Crazy. Oh God. God bless him. Now, is anyone else doing this type of glass work? Uh, they're starting to, yeah. yeah. I've, uh, it's, it's happening. And, and there's some interesting things. There's a couple of kids out in Japan that are doing some really nice things that are very cellular. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's kind of nuts doing this. So it's, it's sort of being copied, but is it all your fault? They're copying you? A lot of it is. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you don't see any of these fossil pieces around either. Sure. And, uh, which is okay. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy about that. So here, here, here is, I'm standing this boat up upside down. These are like how the whole thing exists in space. And here are the, the, uh, the frames kind of laying on the side. So. You know, I've got the, the, the plan view laid out on this board, and I've got these verticals standing up so that I know where they're going to be, and then we build it, stand it all up, connect it all together. Now this frame right here is not the piece, it's something to work on over, and now we're starting to work over, over the frame, and starting to fill the frame in. Find the uh, you know the areas for seating. Both parts are beautiful. They're just very cool, very fluid. <coughs> I put it in a suitcase. So the the uh, the metaphor for travel and research and thing is all all together. So this is about the size of a trombone case. Okay. Here it is. Here's the handle. And, oh. Yeah. This is kind of Okay, everybody goes to the museum, right? So I just love the architecture of the, this attic black figure baseball over at Bar Cleveland Museum of Art. I mean, it's right across the street. It's very cool. The way this handle, these handles go in, and the way this, uh, this top finial sticks out like this. So. So here's a, an example of a piece that's made in sections, all symmetrical around a central axis. So there were like seven sections to put together.
together. So I built a bunch of them all, all well defined. On out. And here's the end of the piece. Here's a, a meandering river running through oh. it. So what's this about? Um, Steve, what's this about? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, everybody knows what this form is. Yes. Uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people do. And, you know, those of us that work in clay, those that work in metal or, or glass, that, you know, we're kind of materialistic. And the anvil is such an iconic thing. Well, the mass of the anvil, the weight of the anvil, what it's made out of, you know, like even picking, you know, even when you buy an anvil, you don't buy it for it's the size of the face, you buy it by the pound, is that right? Something like that? It's like you buy a 150 pound anvil, it's like this big, you know, it's this little thing. So this thing, this thing is probably 36 inches long and it weighs three pounds, I guess. But to make an anvil in this, delicate way uh, says something about the animal and it says something about the glass. So it's, it, it's, it's very materialistic to me anyway. And I, I think other people kind of get it. So, was that a commission or you just wanted to build an animal? I wanted to build an animal. <laughs> <laughs> it's too, too cool. To, I, I was so excited about it and I kept it a secret for a long time. I didn't tell anybody that I was doing this. So I've, I've built five now. So uh, very cool. Here's a Windsor chair. Was it a hallway? No. No, the only cat jumped in there. <laughs> is that the actual size of the chair? It is. Okay. Yeah, it's a full size chair. Yeah. Wow. What do you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> Those of you that are practitioners, uh, you know, you know Dan Fox. Is, is Dan Fox shooting your work? Shoot my own work. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Take good images. This is even bigger. This is this is like this wing back chair is about this tall. This is out at the Glass Museum in Tacoma. And here's another narrative. Marty and I were floating down the Snake River. This is called Snake River Shelter. You know, maybe sometime all we're going to have left are artifacts of what we thought the natural environment used to look like. And here is now a rock with a branch in it. So I don't, that's kind of absurd. I had to. Here's an early basket. I do like, I like artifacts. I like all kinds of crafts. Where do you, are, is every one that you showed us in a museum or do you have your own museum at home where you keep some? <laughs> Marty? <laughs> we don't have. Uh, <laughs> I have, the galleries have a collection of work that are for sale, essentially. I have a small body of work at the studio. My studio is down on Perkins Avenue. Uh, it's in Midtown. And you're welcome to come down. Call me and, and come down and, and hang out a little bit. And uh, the, the idea is to get the work out where it can be seen. There's a number of pieces that are in museums that are kind of around the country. There's one at the Smithsonian, you know, one of the early, early first pieces we went there, which was very cool. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's, I haven't, I don't have anything in San Francisco yet. I'm trying to work on that. I don't know how to do that. But I finally got a couple of pieces uh, at the Glass Museum. It's, it's working pretty nice, so I uh, haven't really, it's kind of evolved, but I have, I, you know, I don't go to a museum and say, here, you know, buy this, I, I don't know how to do that. How do you treat 
transport crate. So is it there's with, crate. Sure, is it filled with like a bunch of paper shavings or? Kari Russell Poole, who does delicate work like this too, uh -huh. fills it with uh, uh, cotton batting or synthetic batting. Okay. I use this stuff called convoluted foam, and it's the foam that one side looks like eight cartons. Okay, sure. So I try to nestle the piece in there so it's held all the way around the same. Okay. okay. So that it's, so when you move the crate, the whole piece moves like this. Sure. Right. Hmm. Uh, geometry again. This is pretty explanatory. This looks like kind of like that video at the very beginning. Here's that sh cylindrical shape, which is actually a, uh, a rectangle. And then it's rotated around. And then we're kind of working out in space and trying to follow that, that element. Oh. So here's a cylinder. Here's the idea of truncation. Uh, I, I mentioned that earlier. Here's the cut line, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm going to cut it later once I build it. And then build it. Build it. Build it some more. I wanted to do a piece that was interactive, visually interactive. So it's kind of this thing. Did your science let you know that this was work when you first started, or did you just trial and error? Did I? Did you, did you, did your science, did you Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Were I, was I able to speculate uh, <laughs> that I could do this because of my background? Right. Uh, yes. My background helped me a lot. But there's a lot of work that I do that I think I can do it. And then I have to still figure it out. So I'm kind of like at that, that mm -hmm. edge. Is that what I'm saying? So, is there a kind of mechanical calculation behind this? Or structure? Calcul mechanical calculation. So, you calculate if this object will fall down because of the weight of it. But the oh, that's not actually not a problem. You, about, you mean it, about the density? Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Uh, that's not, not really an issue. Mechanically, they're 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 designed to be self-supporting, uh -huh. so uh, they can be self-supporting. In other words, they can stand, and they can be handled and moved. Right? That's. But there's no calculation there. There's no like. There's no equation that says. Like, what, what's the limit? There probably is a limit. Yeah. So this piece is uh, somewhere on the order to be presented in, in a multiple ways. So each of the cubes that's been truncated can be taken apart. But once you realign it, the cylinder, when you look at it from the end, is always in line. It's mm -hmm. straight through. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. image is from the, the Akron Art Museum. And this piece is at a museum. It was mentioned at the top of that, that video. Uh, it has a low coefficient of expansion. It's durable. It's tough. And you can work with it. Now, if I work with soda glass, it has a higher coefficient of expansion. It's not as tough. It's not as durable. And the higher coefficient of expansion makes it more difficult to flame these, there's some, some of those little fossils over here, you know, flame working, this stuff would be a flame working soda glass, flame working lead glass, that's a different thing. So all the laboratory apparatus in 
it's made, almost all of it, is mainly made on the with a torch and on a lathe. So that's the way they're constructed, the torch. That coefficient of expansion that you mentioned so much, right? Cut easily. Make a mistake, you can cut it easily, and uh, working with it, it's, it, it burns rapidly, but it still stops. It has no, it has no bearing on how it moves. It does move. It actually moves slower than soda glass. Soda glass is much softer. More so. Control it better if it moves slow, right? Well, it. That depends on how hot you get it. It depends what you what you want to do with it. So, it because it moves slower or faster has nothing to do with with what you want to do with it. I, I kind of don't know exactly. You, you're making a supposition, supposition that I'm not sure that it's correct. Well, I'm looking at the color they use, which is just clear. And the color. So like the shape of what you're making has to be pronounced and then you have to think about like how it's going to move while you're... I could, pro I could probably move soda glass in the same way. So have you ever uh, tried to come up with a form, your own formula for a glass? Oh, well, formula for a glass? Your, yeah, like that would be not since, gra not since graduate school. Yeah, is that something you think that there would be a glass that could be formulated that it would even be a better, better glass to you? They have, they have one. They do. Okay. Yeah, it's it's called uh, flint. This look, oh Jesus, I can't think of it because I don't use it. There is a glass that has got a zero coefficient of expansion, which means that you can you can take it cold and weld it. Okay. Um, but it's so hard to use. Very stiff, not very hard. So, it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, anyway, this is this is the end of your thing. This is my capstone here. Second great artist of the week. That that piece that's that multiple piece. That was about a year and a half ago. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, average, the, average, the, the average piece is, a, is about four months. So, yeah, they're, they're kind of ridiculous. To, <laughs> but, Are you doing any work at the University of Akron? Their synergy program is so amazing. No, I have not. Ted Sikora is a big film fan. Yeah. Uh -huh. I did I did I I know Ted, but I don't know her. Yeah. And I don't know I don't know Ted well either. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. You did a great job on the Yeah, there's 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 also um Another architect that's part of the University of Akron School of Art, uh, Petra Guber, uh -huh. who is um, doing, keeps doing research on uh, how to create materials that that you can actually have a, a more sustainable built environment. How so, to build a what? A, a more sustainable built environment. Uh -huh. So they're they're structures that are. They, you know they last, but oh. they're, they're but they're more organic in nature. Oh, yeah. Pretty interesting. Brent, you have a science uh, engineering background. Would you? Uh, my first introduction to any kind of glass like this was like chemistry class. You know, we get to bend around with yeah, it. Yeah, did yeah. You, did yeah. you? Is this kind of? I mean, looking back on it, were you interested back <coughs> then in this type of this type of work or no? Sure. Not at all. No, we did that. We made pipettes in chemistry. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. I think physics was more interesting. I mean, I rely on that, but the, I don't think that it had anything to do with it. You know, I think I would have come to it later. You know, just work with. I think clay.
Clay was the big deal. I mean, Clay was the catharsis. You know, I, I had a choice of going into Clay or going into Glass. And one was like Clay only, and one was Glass, and I could get a minor in ceramic sculpture. So that's where I that's where I went. One other question. When you I know how to sign a piece like this, but how do you sign these these pieces? I don't. No. <laughs> uh, I'm, Everyone knows who's done it. Yeah, hopefully that. And then once in a while there'll be a loop in there with my initials. Oh, oh. Any other questions? Have we gone past our time? We're uh, fine. We're fine. Oh. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks here. everyone. Take a look at his glass pieces over on the table and please oh, help yourself yeah. to more.